good time. Okay. Um, I'd like to call the meeting to order uh, for the May 8, 2023 uh, Citizen Bond Oversight Committee. It's now about 6.05, I believe, and we are recording. Uh, would we please rise and say the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. John, our secretary, we call the roll. Okay. Uh, Brendan R. Doughton. He is not going to be here tonight. Excuse the absence. Yes, I have a. Lorraine Hughes. Present. Anton Younger. Present. Jason Lindsay, he's also active, uh, absent. Uh, John Ma. Not here yet. Tamika Bullock. Present. Uh, Ariel, she is it? Yeah, present. And uh, John Anderson. So Very we good. have five present. Thank you. Three absent. And I got a letter from Jason saying he can't come tonight okay. also. Um, you have been given the, distributed the, uh, cons oh, uh, would you, uh, any objections to the adopting of the agenda? Since there are no objections, the agenda shall be adopted as is. Um, comments by the chairperson. What we're going to do tonight, we have our auditors, our financial and performance auditors on the line. It's going to be a Zoom call from them. So they take a half hour each. So we're going to do the, the financial and the performance audits first, discuss those. We'll take a break. And then after that, we'll uh, discuss the review of the um, the board policy. So it should be a full night. And if we have time left over, we'll we'll finish out the agenda. But uh, uh, so that's what we're going to be doing tonight. Um, we have a request for uh, public comment, Don. Thank you very much. We largely have a brand new CBOC with limited experience serving on an oversight body. Even those that have served on such a body in the past or may be serving on a different oversight body may not be as fully aware of their duties and responsibilities as they might be. If I may, I'd like to remind this CBOC of the name of this body with particular emphasis on the first word. It's the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee. You're all serving as representatives mm -hmm. of a quarter million residents of West County. The question you all need to ask yourself, not just tonight, but every day, is how can you say that you're representing the people when you never really speak with the people. For instance, you're representing people like me, but only tonight have I learned all of your names. I have, though, zero means of reaching out to you to let you know my thoughts on the bond program. There are no phone numbers or email addresses posted or shared, so people like me can reach out and share my thoughts. And the, the more you get to know me, you'll learn that I have a lot of thoughts on just about everything. Even when I was chair of the CBOC, I pushed the district to issue email addresses on the West County server. It never happened. By the way, I also suggested to numerous superintendents and board members that they create email addresses for the student trustees. And they finally started that a short time ago. I invited each and every one, each and every CBOC member to either publicize, as I did, their own personal email address. If they are concerned about privacy, they can always create a free Gmail account to be used for CBOC for business. It's easy peasy and sends a clear message to the people you're representing that you actually value their input. Some of the topics that the CBOC discusses can be complicated, such as the board policy presentation later tonight. As a member of the public, I'm relegated to just two minutes to comment on a presentation that has been budgeted for 45 minutes. I can guarantee you that my thoughts on this are vast and would take far more than the allotted time. Being able to reach out to you all to provide you with written comments that you can peruse at your leisure and be able to have a back and forth discussion and respond to questions, send the message that you're more than just a seat warmer. Please help we the people in our quest to advise the people who claim to represent us. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Uh, I just want to tell the new people on the public comments, there are comments that are not on the agenda, items on the agenda and the public comments. And we don't really 
talk back to them at this point. Just absorb what they've said. Okay, good. Um, we are now on the uh, consent agenda. Uh, the um, request log minutes from February 27th meeting, minutes from March 27th meeting. All three documents have been uh, distributed with the agenda. Are there any, um, any, any objections? Hmm? Any objections? Any objections to this? Yes, Anton. <clears throat> I would like to suggest that they, the three items be taken off the consent calendar and considered individually. Okay. That is, that is the board members' right. So they are now all taken off and will be considered individually. Where would you like those placed, sir? Oh, right here is fine. Okay. So as the first action items, as okay. A, B, and C. Okay. All right. Well, let's see. What page is the information requested? That's five. Number five. Page five. All right. Let's all turn to that. Are there any objections? to the request log. I don't think the request log is a matter of information, so I don't think it requires a uh, an action. So I was just suggest that uh, the uh, in the minutes as information and not uh, require action. Okay, so that's not the one you were worried about. Um, Madam Chair? Yes, sir. It's on the agenda for action. There's no... Um, Nothing that hurts us by adopting it. Right. As accepting the information as, as it has been given to us. Mm -hmm. I assume this was put together by staff. Yes, yeah. right. This just gives you a, this is a log that tells you who asked, you send it to Sylvia, who asked the question. So you know that it was received, who it went to, mm -hmm. and when you got a response. So we've always had this in the front and under the, consent agenda so i well could i is it a motion in order sure well i, I would move that <clears throat> the uh cb so information request log may 1 2023 be removed from the, the consent calendar and uh, be recorded in the minister's information may 1 2 i don't see any may it's, well i'm reading from the uh, agenda yeah. It's the header of the table on okay. page five. Oh. Yes. I mean, we have the member clarify our motion because I think you might have two motions. We've already removed the consent, this item from the consentage item. Are you saying that in the future, it no longer be placed on the agenda and just be distributed as information? I would accept that. Okay, so that'll be our first motion. And then the second motion would be just to accept this as information, which would be moot if your first motion succeeds. Right. Thank right. you. Okay, so okay. for the minutes, the motion is to remove the... Go ahead, Anton. You want to say your motion? Well, I'll accept what the parliamentarian... The... And I'm going to write it down so we have, we I can okay. send it to whoever's doing our minutes. That the what do we call this officially? The information request log no longer be placed on the agenda and be distributed to board members as information only. Well, again, in the past, we uh, have had information items in the agenda, so I'm not, and that's very common, and I'm not objecting to that. I think I think that's very desirable. We have so a that's reference. Not, that's not what I'm wanting. I just don't want it on for action. I want it on for information. Okay. So it would be like the roster? Yes, like exactly. That. So the information request log no longer be placed on the agenda for action, only as an information item. Correct. Okay. Information item. Okay. Do we have a second? I'll could second. I could I make a comment? Maybe not at this time. Uh, before can okay yes. 
So just wanted to clarify as staff, um, this public information log is a way to expedite any request that a CDOC member has for additional information. So if you're seeking information from the district, you send it to the CDOC liaison and we track that we received that request. And then we also track how quickly we've provided that response and if we provided it. So I just ask that you take in consideration in your vote tonight, I think the benefit of it being reviewed is what if we missed an email? So what if a CDOC member um, made a request and it wasn't reflected here? Or what if we might mark that item as resolved and it didn't seem resolved to the member? Mm -hmm. um, we would wanna make sure that we received that feedback so that we could update or you know, revise the log so that it represented that request and that it really demonstrated that we either fulfilled that request or that we hadn't fulfilled that request. So we we we, we hope to seek um, your feedback on it. And so that's why it was a consent item, but it's it's to the committee to choose. Yeah, I just right. wanted to share that as a, a staff consideration. That was just information given. Um, do we have any other uh, motions or any other discussion on this? No other discussion. Okay, so we'll have a vote. Well, you can try, since all the questions have been answered, you can certainly ask if there are no objections again. Okay. See if that works. Are there any objections to re removing it from the assent, consent area and putting it into uh, as information only? Okay, if there are no objections, we'll, we'll do that. That's fair. All right, the second item on that were the minutes for February 27th. And let's get to that page is page seven. Are there any motions uh, or corrections for this? Yes. All right. Uh, uh, there's a number of corrections, uh, including that there's a attachments that are referred to that are not in the minutes. I would suggest they just be removed from the agenda and we bring it back next meeting. I'm sorry, what did you say first? I didn't hear. Well, in regards to the state response to CBOC inquiry on the audits, it says see attached. And there's no attachment in the minutes. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's not clear what the issue is. But I, and again, there's a number of other uh, issues. I don't know if it's useful to go through now. I just make a motion that they be uh, tabled to the next meeting to be okay. corrected. And would you... Uh... Write those and send those to. Well, I'd be delighted to do that. Okay, so your motion is to remove this, the minutes for February twenty seventh to add additional comment, and that. Uh, do I have a second? Oh, I'm sorry, Cameron. Um, we always recommend that you go ahead and adopt the minutes, what you have, and that they will be fixed. Remember, we can go back and fix minutes anytime we want to. So we would adopt what we have with corrections coming at the next minute, at the next meeting. And the reason we recommend that is so that any action that got approved can still move forward and corrections can still move forward. Oh, at the meeting, at yeah. the meeting. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, <clears throat> yes. I, that's not acceptable to me. Uh, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a number of, uh, of technical corrections and to, uh, <laughs> It's not clear what we would be approving. We're approving corrections that we don't know that are gonna be made subsequent to the meeting, but will not be brought back to the committee. Uh, that doesn't seem to be uh, useful. Okay. So you wanna keep your motion as it was. Yes. All right, do we have a second for that? I'll second. Okay, we'll second it. And, um, <laughs> Are there any objections to the motion? Okay, good. So we will remove that from the packet. How about the minutes for March 27th, Anton? Uh, I'd like sorry, to Anton. I would, again, there's a number of, uh, of uh, <clears throat> corrections that I think should be made. Uh, so I would like to, uh, to remove if they be. Uh, Referred to okay, so do I have a second for that motion? I'll second. 
Okay. Do I have any objections for having that happen? No? Okay, we'll remove that also. Thank you. That's sure. Um, Don? Just a little cl clarification point about I'm, I'm asking because I don't understand. Uh we're dealing with minutes. I mean, typically somebody could review the tape uh and see what happened at the meeting, but a lot of times when you've got people that did not actually attend the meeting, they abstain from approving the minutes. I said typically. Okay, because we see it all of the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm sorry, watch your Tell me no, I'm wrong. Uh, I said, but if they're if they're abstaining, if you've got some brand new people here that were not attending that February meeting, for instance, and if they'd abstain, would you still have a, the necessary votes quorum uh, to to pass that uh, that motion? Because if you got one, if you need you need five votes, yeah. and you've only got four people or three people that are voting in the, in the affirmative, is, does it still pass? Technical. Yes. So I apologize if that meant shake my head. No, it's a reminder to myself to bring this to the chair. I know that many people that is a custom of if you do not attend a meeting, then you should not vote on the minutes. In Robert's Rules of Order, that is actually 100% incorrect. You still have an obligation to vote on the minutes because all you're voting on is are they accurate or not? You could ask those questions in a meeting. So that was the only part that I was, okay. it's the custom part. But they may choose not to vote at all, seeing as how they weren't at the meeting and they have no idea whether this is accurate or inaccurate. And so the bottom line is, it's not an affirmative vote, not necessarily an affirmative vote. Mm -hmm. So they, they have they have the requisite number. I mean, if you, get, if you only got four people tonight or three people that can say yes on that vote, mm -hmm. is that sufficient okay. for passage? Okay. That's the question I'm asking. Okay. Anton? I support what the parliamentarian says. What if you read Robert's rule, it says that in reviewing the minutes, if you were not there, if you think that they are reasonable and accurate and complete, you can you're entitled to vote yes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and in the instance tonight, we didn't have any objections to that. You didn't have a vote point. either. Yeah. That's the point. Well, if you have no objections, isn't that like having a vote? That is a vote. Yeah. That is a vote. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So tonight we're it's so, a mute point. So so I believe I, I was not at the February uh twenty seventh meeting. I wasn't even on the CBOC. But I believe under Robert's rules, I have a right to if I think the minutes make sense and they're complete, I could approve them. Mm -hmm. And therefore you would not have an issue in terms of a uh, quorum vote. All right. Okay. Fine. Then we can move on. Uh, we need a vote on postponing. Please. Yes, I'm sorry. Did we? But we did. We did say the no objections. No objection. Okay, yeah. great. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Now the um, we have a financial <laughs> audit. It is by uh, Christie White Incorporated. Uh, they will uh, give their presentation. Then we will have. Uh, if you don't mind, if there are any objections, let me know. We'll have a round robin of questions of two each. We have a half hour to cover this this uh, audit, and we will have public comment on it. And then at uh, at the half hour at the half hour time is up, we'll go on to the the next audit. Does anybody have any objections to that? Yes, Anthony. <laughs> I have 44 questions, so you're going to yeah. allow me to have two. Uh, no, I, we're going to do a round robin of two, but any question, I'm sorry, I didn't say this, any questions that are not asked tonight, you can give in writing and you will get a reply from the auditors or the staff to your questions. But we just don't have time to go through all 44 questions. Well, what I would suggest is that... Uh, the questions that we do not get to tonight, we do what you suggest, have this staff. I think the staff, some of the questions are staff questions. And we ask the staff and uh, auditors to bring the answers back to our next meeting mm -hmm. so that the committee can review them as a committee. Uh, otherwise, uh, the committee will not benefit uh, from the discussion right. on because as one answers a question, there may be a 
follow-up question to make clarification. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be useful and if, if, if it's in order, I'd be open to make a motion on that, both in terms of the uh, Christy White audit and the Bailey audit, if that's uh, appropriate. Yeah, I think that. You wanna make your motion? <clears throat> I would uh, move then that uh, any uh, <clears throat> written questions or oral questions that are submitted tonight on the uh, Christy White audit or Bailey. I'm sorry, is that all questions? I know ones that aren't answered then. That's what you said. <laughs> right? Say your motion. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to. Uh, can you read what you have so far? Any questions on the audit? <laughs> uh, written or oral. <clears throat> that are not answered tonight be answered by staff and auditors in writing and brought back to the next CBOC meeting for review. Okay. Do I have a second? I'm second. All right. Good. <laughs> Get involved. <laughs> and, and I, and I and do have copies of my questions. Could I hand them out? Uh, I emailed yours to everybody. I you, would like to hand them out because under our bylaws, any document that's presented it. at yeah. a meeting has Maybe. to be in the minutes. I, I don't believe an email is going to get in the minutes. Okay. All right, sure. Hand it out. Thank and you. our bylaws says any document handed out at a meeting you want me to pass it open? are included in the minutes. Okay. They're on the table. Over Anyone there. who doesn't have them, you can take so forgive me, Madam Chair. I know we're getting into good discussion. Yeah. We have to keep moving. We need to go back now to your, now that we've adopted your um, yeah. motion to the 30 minutes and the two round robin questions. Okay. So we can go back to that. We can ask for no objection again. If we do not have an, if we have an objection, we can always go to a vote. Okay. Um, do we have any objections on the round robin? And the, post and, 30 the minute time limit. and the 30 minute time limit. No objections. So to prove. And Chip, would you watch the clock? It's 25 after right now. Did, did, did we vote on my motion? We, no, yeah. No objections. No objections. So it went. Okay. Um, Melissa, will you introduce the, the and tell us the name of the people who are giving the audit, if you would, please? Absolutely. Um, Good evening, everyone. Um, tonight, it is my privilege to introduce Michael Ash from Christy White, who will be presenting the bond financial audit. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Uh, I, first, I just want to thank you all for uh, inviting me here tonight. Um, am I able to share my screen? Yes, you should be able to. Okay. Let me... Double check the security. I was just going to walk through some of the pages on the audit, if that's okay. Yeah, we're going to update the settings now so that you'll be able to. Yeah, it still says host disabled participant screen sharing. We're working on it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Tell us what page you on. Want to get that? Yes, on, on the agenda. You go. That's. He may not have our agenda. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Page. Let's see. Okay, so. Sorry, sir. We're getting to your audit in here. He has it up now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. In your booklet, it's page fifty. Or 51. Mm -hmm. 51. Okay, everybody there? Yeah. Okay, good. Go ahead, okay. Mr. Ash. All right. Thank, thank you again. And, and I just want to um, introduce myself. My name is Michael Ash, partner with Christy White. Um, this is my fifth year um, as being the audit partner for the district um, as well, well as the bond financial audit. So um, under government code, um, I can only do one more audit as the partner. So I could do the June 20, June 30th, 2023 audit, but I would not be um, eligible because I would have 
uh, done the audit for six straight years for the June 30th, 2024 audit. And I apologize. I, I received a set of questions last week and I was able to, to go through them and have answers that I could give through my presentation. And then today I received a bunch more and I did not have time to get to the, any of those. So if I'm not able to answer your questions, um, I apologize, but I will do my best. Um, I think the first thing with this audit um, that you'll note is that that it was it was late. Um, so it's supposed to be submitted to the CBOC uh, by March 31st, and that did not happen. Um, there was a delays in getting documents uh, for both the bond audit and the district audit, and um, so we unfortunately were not able to complete the audit uh, by those deadlines. And I know one of the other questions was, um, you know, with the staff turnover. Um, did we notice any differences from, um, you know, the first part of the, the audit year to the second part? Um, the answer is no. I, you know, we didn't notice anything, but I do think that that contributed to the delay um, in the request and the re is the reason why the audit is late. Um, now, there's no, in education code, and there is a way to get extensions for the district audit um, through the County Office of Education, but for the bond audit, um, there, there's no remedy and no way to do that. So, um, yes, this audit um, is, is unfortunately late. And, um, you know, I, I know the district is, I mean, it, it's not just this district, it's been statewide. We had 70 audit extensions this year in our financial um, overall audits, not not bond audits. Um, but, you know, I think just statewide, it, it's, it's a real issue with turnover and, you know, coming out of COVID, I think it, it is also contributing to it. So, okay, I'm going to walk you through some of this. Um, one thing I'll say that is, is very confusing sometimes, um, and a lot of people think that this audit report is Christy White's um, report. So the financial statements are the districts. Um, we assist the district in compiling the information because we know all the stuff that needs to go in it. But the, the, the financial statements, the notes of the financial statements, that is all the district. So the district is responsible for that. So they should be able to answer you know, any questions regarding that. Now, as the audit firm, what we give is our auditor's opinions. Um, so uh, we have a, an independent auditor's opinion, and then we have um, another independent auditor's report report that I'll get to as well. Um, so just moving on, um, you know, I don't know what exactly what page it is in your packet, but, you know, there's just some information here um, that's in here talking about, um, you know, some information about the district, um, the different bond measures and the issuances. Um, and then you get into a list of the governing board members and the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee members. And then starting with this page with our first letterhead. So this is the first, um, this is the auditor's opinion. And I wanted to walk through this because if you've, if you've reviewed these before, you'll notice that it changed this year. Um, so the opinion used to be down, kind of buried at the bottom of this first page. Um, well, they came out with, with new auditing standards uh, that were effective for June 30th, 2022. And they really wanted that opinion to be front and center. Um, they didn't want there to be any confusion. Um, you know, a lot of times people only read the first paragraph or two on a page. And so you'll see that the opinion has moved and it's now at the, at the top. Um, and so really, it, it, that's, that's, that's really the bones of, of, of what we're doing is giving an, our auditors, independent auditors opinion on the financial statements and whether they're presented fairly in all material respects. And so what that opinion is right there, that's an unmodified opinion. Um, that means that in our opinion, the financial statements as they are presented um, are fairly stated in all material respects. So that's the best opinion that you can possibly have. Um, and then this other stuff is just language. Uh, you'll probably note that the auditor responsibilities, this, this change to all these bullet points, um, that wasn't um, there uh, last year. That, again, that's just because of the new auditing standard, the wording changed here. Um, supplementary information. So you have one supplementary information schedule. Um, it's the 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 SACS reconciliation. So it's the it's the um, adjustment between the unaudited actuals and and these financial statements. Um, that's that is actually um, a, a state thing, and it goes in all of the the overall district reports. Um, usually, you don't see that schedule in bond reports. Uh, it started before my time, so I'm not sure if the the CBOC or if the district wanted that schedule to be in the audit. Um, but but we do have it in there. Um, and then the last one that references is the other report that we have, which, which is in the back. Um, so all, all financial and performance audits, bond audits, are required to be done under what's called government auditing standards. Um, and I'll get, I'll get into more of what that means when I get to that report. 
So the financial section, now we just get into the, the you know, the balances as of June 30th, 2022, um, presented typically in a, in a, you know, in a bond fund, you have a lot of uh, cash and investments, unless you're towards the end of um, the bond measure. So that's always the, the largest account um, in bond funds um, until the end of the, until the end of the project is that cash and investments. And then this is just the, um, the, the, the income statement, statement of revenues, expenditures, and changes during the year. Um, you'll know, and, and I'll go through the, when I get to the SACS adjustment page, that second line, that net decrease in the fair value of investments, that's a new thing. Um, and, and I'll get into that and what exactly that is and what that means um, when I get to that, that, that page, because there was an audit adjustment for that this year. Then you get into the notes, and this is just more support and more detail for um, the, the statements themselves. Um, a lot of this stuff is just required to be in there. Um, you'll see a more of a breakout of the district's cash and investments in note two. Moving on, you'll just see, again, just some, some small interest receivable. Um, that's typical for a bond fund. Usually you don't see a big accounts receivable in, in bond funds. Um, some accrued liabilities. I know there was a question on that of, of why the payroll was so small and, and the district can provide you that, but the, the accrued liabilities, that's just the, the amounts that are as of the end of the year that were incurred in the fiscal year, but not paid until after. Um, so that's why that's such a small amount compared to the, um, the list that, that, that you had sent over that had all of the payroll expenditures for the year. This litigation one, we, we, we recommend to our districts to, to put that in there. Um, some districts don't like to put it in there. Um, basically, it's just saying that, you know, litigation does come up from time to time. Um, if there's something material that, that we find through our audit procedures, we would either disclose that or, you know, possibly make an adjustment to the financial statements, depending on what that is. But this is just in the report, just, just saying that, you know, litig litigation matters happen from time to time. Um, and, and just uh, in the opinion of the management and legal counsel, um, nothing material impacting the bond fund as of June 30th, 2022. Construction commitments. So that's just um, amounts that are on contracts that the district has outstanding as of June 30th, 22. Uh, those expenditures aren't accrued yet, uh, but there are balances left on the contract. So they get disclosed in a footnote under what's called construction commitments. And then the district has always liked this um, note six. This is not required, but the district does have other funds in fund 21 that aren't related to the measures uh, D, E, and R, um, mostly related to the state funding um, from those facilities projects. And so that's just a reconciliation of what is in um, the overall building fund versus what is in these measures and what is in those other building funds. Okay, so this was that supplementary information. And, and I know there, I, there was one comment um, about what RSI is. Um, so the difference, there's required supplementary information and supplementary information. So required supplementary information is supplementary information that's required by the Governmental Accounting Standards Board. Um, that's typically like you're in your district audit, uh, your budgetary comparison schedule for the general fund, your, your OPEB stuff, your pension stuff. There's no required supplementary information um, for a bond audit. Um, and as I said before, there's no supplementary information required either. Um, but this is this schedule right here, this reconciliation has been in there. Um, there was an audit adjustment that we recommended that the district post and, and they agreed. And, and um, so the adjustment got posted. So what this is, is cash and county treasury. Um, the district maintains a large portion of their cash and investment balance with the Contra Costa treasury. And in the past, historically, the book value and the fair value, those two numbers have been very, very similar. Um, so they've, there's never been a material difference between the two until this year because the stock market um, was doing so bad as of as fiscal year end. And it was not just in Contra, Contra Costa County, it's in um, pretty much all the counties. Um, so there was a significant difference there. Um, and under GASB 31, the cash and county treasury is technically supposed to be reported at fair value. Now that's not required by CSAM, um, California Schools Accounting Manual. Uh, the CDE doesn't require it, um, but it is, gap. It is, um, you know, because of GASB, which is the Governmental Accounting Standards Board. 
Um, so we recommend it because it was such a large amount that that an audit adjustment be made for that this year. And, and it was made for these financial statements. And then other independent auditors report. So this is that report, um, the government auditing standards. So every bond audit has to be, Prop 39 bond audit has to be done under what's called government auditing standards. And what that means is that we have to, as part of our audit procedures, look at your internal controls over financial reporting. I always get this question, why do you not give an opinion on internal controls? Um, why, why is it just a report on it? This goes way back um, you know, to the beginning. And, and I think it's a cost benefit thing for governments that they decided that unlike public companies where they do get an opinion on internal controls, that governments, they just said it would be too, um, it would not be cost effective for governments to get um, an opinion on internal controls because the audit would be much more costly because the procedures would, would definitely expand quite a bit um, to, give, to be able to give an opinion on those internal controls. Um, but what we do, if we do come across anything that we de determine to be a material weakness or a significant deficiency or any um, non-compliance uh, that's material to these financial statements, it does have to be reported in what's called an audit finding. And we didn't have any um, audit findings um, this year for the bond audit. Um, another question um, that I saw was related um, in, in the performance audit, the, um, the, the, the board, the governance letter, there was a... Um, uh, a significant risk of, I, I saw in there, um, and, and you pointed it out as well, um, management override of controls. So in all of our financial audits, we also deem management override of controls to be a significant risk, um, every audit that we do. And what that means is, you know, it doesn't matter how good the system of internal controls is, if management just is able to override and you know if somebody above is just able to change things and there's no you know checks and balances there um no controls we design our audit procedures um with that in mind management override of controls so we look at things like journal entries at year end um in the control testing ourselves with uh, payroll testing cash disbursements cash receipts um, we're also designing our audit procedures um to mitigate um, that that significant risk of that and we did not come across any instances of that. We did not see any in our samples um, of any management override of controls. And then finally, uh, the schedule of findings and recommendations. Um, this would be where you'd see if you had any um, financial statement audit findings, they would be here. Um, if we had any prior audit findings, um, also have to provide a, a summary and a, a current status on those. Um, and that's it. Um, that, that's that's my presentation. I, I know there there are some questions that, that you're going to ask me, and, and and I'm certainly prepared to answer those um, as best I can. And um, if if I'm not able to answer something, I, I won't I, I won't just make up an answer. I'll I'll say I'm not sure, and I'll go back and research that and, and send that over to the district. Thank you, Mr. Etch. Um, we're planning on doing is having a round robin of our committee members, giving them uh, two questions each and um, then having a second round, depending upon the time limit. Um, so uh, let's start with John, do you have any sure. questions? Well, the question I had was relative to the fair value and he explained, he explained it to my satisfaction. Okay. Good, all right, Ariel? Oh, yes, um, hi, uh, so I have one question. Um, would you please describe your audit procedures uh, when generating this report? Thank you. Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. So, it, you know, it, there's there's a lot that goes into an audit. So there's planning, there's risk assessment, um, there's review of internal controls, and then there's substantive audit procedures. So um, the way that works, there are certain planning documents that we have to have, um, you know, the and signed engagement letter, um, understanding of the entity, um, things like that, that, that we have in all of our audits that we do. Um, then, you know, like I explained before, risk assessment, we look at, um, you know, what are the significant risks um, in the audit? And, and that varies, you know, um, typically bond funds, the risk, the risks are going to be the same because a lot of bond funds are, are, are equal. The, 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 the money is typically in the cash and investments. There's not usually a, a ton of revenue recognition issues because it's proceeds that come in when there's a new bond issued. Um, 
So then, you know, so we look at that, we look at key um, internal controls, which, you know, cash disbursements is a big one. Expenditures are huge um, for, for a bond fund. Um, and then we do some standard procedures at, at year end. So, you know, most of it's in cash and county treasury and in and, and LAFE. Um, so we're looking at those cash and county reconciliations. We're looking at those balances. Um, if there's any bake statements, we look at those balances as well. Just just tying those. So that's that's some of the substantive procedures that we do. And then, um, you know, draft. We, we like I said, we assist in drafting the report. Um, you know, send it to the district, incorporate any comments that they might have on it, and then give our auditors opinions. Thank you. You're very welcome. So, um, what's I mean, what's the challenge? What what are the challenges when you were doing um, the audit with uh, school district? Sure, sure. Well, you know, COVID has changed quite a bit. Um, you know, we used to we used to send an, a whole audit team out. You know, every at least twice. You know, probably for for a bond audit, it might only be once, but you know, twice a year. And and since COVID, a lot of the audit is now remote. Um, that depends on you know the district and. And if they want us to come in person now, we will now that it's um, now that, you know, COVID is, uh, has, you know, died down substantially. But, you know, that that's a that's tough. It's hard to get things remotely. Uh, big challenge we just have is getting the information for the audit. And that was unfortunately with this one. It's just just not receiving all of the information timely um, to be able to complete our audit on time. Um, that, that That's always a, that's always a big challenge. Oh, so, so uh, you uh, did this audio report remotely? When when do you? Oh, sorry. Okay, to me. You have any questions? Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, so do you plan to resume an in-person audit procedure? And uh, if yes, when? Um, did you ask if we were resuming in-person audits at the district? I, I, I'm not sure I understood your question. She was, uh, the question was, so if you guys are doing it remotely, and if so, if you're doing everything remotely, when are you going to go back or are you going to go back to doing the audits in person? How sure. Does that yeah, yeah. I mean, we have started doing uh, um, in-person audits, definitely. Uh, we have we have not with this district. Uh, we, we are on the, the interim piece of the district audit for 22-23, and that's still being done remotely. Um, I think everyone has a different level of comfort and and audit teams coming out. Some districts are just not ready for us to come out yet, um, but we will. It won't look the same. We won't come with an entire team. It'll be a smaller group, probably maybe one or two people um, with with assistance um, being you know provided offsite and remote. We have a great portal. Uh, it's called SureLink, where the district can upload information to. Um, so we are we are equipped. Uh, we, we can do an audit remotely. I miss the in-person stuff. I think it's a little bit harder to to audit, and uh, you know, it, there's a little less comfort there when you're not, you know, face to face with people. But um, audits can be done remotely. Um, so it's really just just up to the judgment of the district whether we'll come back and what that'll look like going forward. And if I could add to that, really. I think that uh, in my experience, the district has experienced some cost savings to the remote portal. It's a fantastic secure portal. And so then there are travel reimbursable expenses associated with the auditors coming. And so there's some gifts that COVID brought us. Um, we became a lot more efficient in doing some of the remote work, um, but definitely to echo um, what Mr. Ash shared, you know, when, the the audit team will ask us for a whole bunch of sample and backup documentation to support all of the different items that they picked and then we upload that to the portal and depending on what the item is if it's contracts if it's an invoice and the the warrant the check that supports that invoice so there's a bunch of different people in the in the office that depending on their respective area, they need to collect all of those documents and then have them uploaded to the portal. And that's where I think we really created some delay in the audit of not uploading everything to Christy White in time um, for them to have the time that they needed to then review all of that documentation and prepare the report. And so as a staff member, I think 
a true recommendation to getting back on track and in terms of the timing of the audit and making sure that we have a draft and that comes before the CBOC, before the statutory deadline of the final report, which is the end of March, is that we have to start our work earlier. Um, we used to start kind of the initial um, audit in like October. And I remember it was like right over January, we were trying to make sure we had everything to the auditor so that in February is when they had everything um, so that they could do those reviews. And this year we were providing them documents in March. Um, and so um, I think that there's a real opportunity to get back on track, but we just have to set our schedule further back so that we start all of that, um, the production of the, the audit request documentation much earlier in the year. Thank you for cutting time-wise. Do you have any other questions? We'll go ahead. Was, it was cost, but if we're saving cost effective, that's fine. Okay. Anton, do you have any questions? In regards to the accrual of payroll, I didn't understand your comment where you indicated that uh, any payroll that was earned in uh, December or in uh, June uh, would uh, have to be accrued. Uh, and you said there was none. Uh, I would think there would be June payroll that was not paid in June. Could I ask the staff that question? Is there payroll for June that was paid in July? So I'm going to give my best answer to the question, but I don't work in the business office on the fiscal team. So we could probably get a more comprehensive answer. My understanding of accruals is this. So our fiscal year ends on June 30. And so there are invoices that are for services through June 30 and payroll through June 30, and those are paid in July. Right. What the business office does is they essentially close the previous fiscal year, typically sometime in August. Right. So if an invoice or a, this might have been a time card shows up after the um, business office has closed the books for the fiscal year, then it's booked as an accrual. So it's paid in a separate batch and it's tracked as an accrual, meaning that expense belonged in the fiscal year that ended in June 30. But the payment of that expense happened after the fiscal year was closed, probably sometime in late August or early September. And so that's why those items are tracked that way. Right. But the June payroll for people uh, that get paid uh, is a payroll monthly? Yes, it is. And the payroll for June is paid July 1? In July. So because of that dollar value, my suspicion without knowing for sure is that was potentially a time card. Well, the point is there's zero cruel payroll in the audit. That's my point. Zero. There's a, there, there's a very small amount that's in there um, from, from what we understood. And you know, again, it's materiality too. You have to look at, you know, I think that the payroll expenditures for the building fund um, were only, if, if I remember correctly from what um, the, the chair had sent over, were only like $840,000 for the year. Um, materiality for, for this is, is well over probably a million dollars. So it would, if it's not material, it wouldn't necessarily be something that if, if the district did not record it that way, it's not something that we would record as an audit adjustment if it's not material. Approved payroll, eight hundred thousand to hundred eight hundred thousand dollars a month's payroll is what hundred thousand dollars. Um, right. Tom, we're cutting close on on time. Oh, you want so, me to answer my second answer my second question? You want me to pass? No, if you would pass and then make sure you get it to them in writing and they'll oh, answer. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Uh, Shia, do you have the? This is Shia Ma. She's a uh, and this is Ariel. She's a new member. She's nice a member. Do you have any questions for this? For the auditor? Not yet. Thank you. Okay. And if you have any, send them in writing to Melissa and she'll send them down. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. The only question I had that you haven't answered is what is, you said uh, measure R restricted funds, <coughs> D and E aren't. What does that mean? Yeah. So that's what, um, so the, Within fund balance, so that's whatever is at, whatever is remaining at the district at, at the end of the year. So assets minus liabilities basically is is fund balance. So there are five different types of fund balance. So there's 
Um, unassigned fund balance, which really means that it's pretty much unrestricted and you can do anything you want it with it. There's assigned fund balance, which that means that at management's discretion, um, what that fund balance represents. There's committed fund balance, um, which that ha that takes a board action to commit and a board action to uncommit. Um, there's non-spendable fund balance, uh, which that would be things like inventory, um, prepaid expenditures, things like that. And finally, there's restricted fund balance. So restricted, um, because the funds in the building fund for these measures are restricted uh, for the purposes in the ballot language and for bond projects, that's why the fund balance is deemed to be restricted. Okay, so they can't touch that. They can't move that elsewhere. Yeah, they, yeah, exactly. If we're unassigned, they could do other things with it. When it's restricted, it has to stay in there and it be spent on allowable projects. Correct. Um, we have one uh, public comment. Don, do you have a question? Not for financial audit, although I do have a question real quick, very brief. Now, I, I understood that the CBOC transitioned from a, uh, a, 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 a calendar year to a, a fiscal year. When did that happen? Because I'm not seeing anything in this audit that indicates when it started and when it ended. Just saying that <clears throat> as of July or June, June 30th, 2022, it doesn't tell me when it starts. So I seem to recall that transition happening essentially at the beginning of this. I could be wrong though, because I'm an old guy and our memory is shot to hell. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I can answer that. We we were adjusting to their, their transition and the audit is from July first uh, 20 or uh, July 1st 22 to June 30th so that's what our reporting is going to be on but then, it doesn't affect the audit at all okay but well, when did previously when did the audit start did they were they a calendar no, year the or audit was always the same the audit all... was always fiscal all right it's just our report our annual report was Good thank you was calendar year yeah. appreciate the clarification sure Okay, uh, that takes care. Remember, any questions you have, please send them to Melissa and she'll pass them on. Thank you, Mr. Ash. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate all your questions and, and I will do the, my best to assist the district in answering um, any of the other questions that, that, that they might not be able to answer. So thank you very much. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Now it's time for uh, Eddie Bailey. Yes. Um, I, good uh, good evening. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Nathan Edelman from ID Bailey, being the bond performance audit um, for us tonight. And he has prepared a PowerPoint presentation that we'll be bringing up here in just a second. Would you like to run your own slides, or would you like us to present for you? Um, I can I can put them up. Okay, terrific. Let so you should be able to share. Um, in Put our, you in the driver's uh, seat. Uh, in our agenda packet, it starts on page 75. Yeah, okay. Do you see my slides? Are they up? We do. Yeah, we do. Okay, cool. And these are the same slides that are that are in your packet. So a little easier for me to control it this way. But yeah, good afternoon. I guess good evening, everybody. So my my name is Nathan Edelman with Hyde. Billy. <clears throat> and I am the I am the independent external auditor, really just working on the performance audit. You just just heard from the under who did the financial statement audit. Some differences with the performance audit that we'll touch on in a, in a couple slides. But also, as last presenter just explained very nicely, actually, you know, our our responsibility versus the district's responsibility. You know, district prepare the financial statements. In this case, the district, since we're talking about the performance audit, not so much about debits and credits, not so much about balance sheets, income statements, but what is district actually doing with, with the funds? What are they doing with the, the bond money? <clears throat> so management, those who run the, those who run the bond program, even, even the board of education, these are the folks who are truly responsible for internal controls, for making decisions. They are the ones running the show. Our, our responsibility as auditors is to just, we, we come in, we cause a lot, we ask questions, we, we ask for things. 
we, 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 we cause trouble. But at the end of the day, through our audit reports, we report back, we report back to you, report back to the CBOC in this case, to the board, the results of the audit. So if management has, if, or if the district, I should say, has a, a clean audit, all credit should go to them for a, a good job to the extent that there's audit findings, then obviously they would also be responsible for, for corrective action. So the, the performance audit objectives, and, and I, like I said, not so much about debits and credits here, but it is what's the district doing with the funds? Is the district using the bond funds for things that are allowable? They are, they're restricted. The district has a lot of limits on what the funds can be used by. The objectives here, these, these mirror what's actually published in the, what's, what's published in our, our performance audit report. And these come from the state. The state of California publishes an audit guide, and it says when you go in and do these performance audits, this is the requirements. This is what we want you to look at. That would be kind of the basic performance audit, and the district can certainly add to that. You can you can change it. You can kind of do whatever to the the scope of work, but you can never remove. You can never go be below what the state says, and the state says to do. The objectives are really these three things, which is to ensure that funds, the bond funds are spent on specific projects, projects per the ballot language, and as well as things that are compatible, allowable for Proposition 39. And that is on a super high level here. That's construction, renovation. It's things, you know, capital improvements to physical buildings, as opposed to obviously, as you, you probably know more than most folks out there, Bond funds cannot be used for running a school district, no, no teacher salaries, whatever, be turned to the bond program, which is kind of the, the third bullet point, which is that to the extent that salaries are funded by the bond program, those need to be those need to be consistent with this attorney general opinion from a few years ago, which really says they need to have a direct nexus to the bond program. So if there is a teacher and they're being funded for their regular recurring teacher job, that is a problem. But if someone, and really it comes out, typically it's project managers, it's folks that work within, within the bond program, they need to be working really for the bond program and not, not, not district general administration. So what did we look at to achieve those objectives, again, on a very high level? And there's, there's actually a table and, and a lot more detail within the report. But you look at policies and procedures. You talk to people. How are these things set up? What does the district do to ensure that funds are used appropriately, that they're used for things consistent with the, the mission, what's been set out by the board? But we also, because we receive the accounting records, we have an accounting of every dollar that flows through the bond program accounting records. As you, as you saw from the presentation about the financial statements that were audited, the district separately tracks the expenditures of the bond program, just as if each one of those bond programs is a separate little entity with its own balance sheets, with its own income statement. But from those accounting records, we then pick samples and we say, okay, give us the invoices, give us the payroll records, whatever it is that, you know, de depending on what it is that's being sampled, but give us support so that we can, that bond funds are being used consistent with those, with those objectives. And so it's looking at, you know, it's payroll records, it's information from HR, it's talking to people, it's looking at invoices that come in from contractors. We may look at actual contracts and, and documents that were uh, approved by the board, but it's looking at the support, looking at the source documents, so they can say, yes, hopefully, yes, these items are allowable, that they're all compatible with, with the bond. So we ended up looking, and it, it almost like a D, E, and R as, as separate audits there's no requirement about achieving a certain percentage the requirement is that you have a representative sample and you might look and, and the way that you read this <clears throat> first line sampled what are the dollar amounts that we looked at in the audit versus the total dollar amounts in in the population and then the percentage so for measure d we ended up with 
48 percent, almost nine and a half. Sorry, four and a half million of the nine and a half million that was incurred fiscal year ending June 30, 2022. Measure E, 93 percent. Measure R, 95 percent. And you know, you may say, well, why is the percentage so high? For the two on the right and so low, we'll say you know, in comparison to one on the, on the left. We're not out there trying to achieve 90%. Uh, it, that would be way more than we would need to uh, have a you know, representative sample. Typically, with these construction contracts, you may have, or construction invoices, a very small number of transactions and they are individually quite large. And so with measure R, where there's not a whole lot of activity going on, I don't know off the top of my head, the number of transactions that were necessary to get to that 492,000, but I'd be willing to bet it's a small number of it. Can be, or it's, it's a small number of transactions that ended up being total that is quite close to that total for the population. Whereas with measure D, that's a little more mature, probably a larger volume of smaller contracts that were run through, but 48% is still quite, quite high. And so with that kind of the 10,000 foot conclusion, the results of, of doing all this, which is these three things here. One, the district has properly accounted for the expenditure held in, in each of those separate bond measures. And the expenditures were made for authorized bond projects. And lastly, for, for salaries, you know, to the extent that any salaries were charged to the bond program, those do have a nexus. Those are consistent with that attorney general opinion. So there's no, you, know, you, don't, you don't get a ranking of you know good or bad or A plus or, or whatever, but you know, this would be another way of saying it's a it's a not an opinion. This is the the performance opinion that is within the packet is I guess I'd call it unmodified if we were to use similar language to the findings. But it's a good thing. There's there's no findings that were identified. There were no internal control deficiencies that are reported um, through the through the performance audit. So that's my presentation. I know there are a number of questions. So I. I will, I'll, I'll, let me stop sharing and I will turn this back over to the, to the CPOC and we'll be happy to try and answer any questions um, as best they can. Yeah. Um, this is the page 75 in our uh, packet is the audit. Um, we're doing a round robin of questions. Um, and each person is getting two questions depending upon the amount of time left. Uh, we have also uh, said that anybody who has questions that were not asked tonight, uh, they could put them in writing and give it to Melissa and she'll pass it on to you for uh, to get it back to us by the next meeting where we can review it. Is that satisfactory? With oh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, to the extent of there's, <laughs> excuse me, any small questions, yeah, we'll get those through through management and um, I guess Melissa would have the honor of okay. getting answers from me, but I can I can try my best. Let's go backwards this time. Uh, Shia, do you have any questions tonight? No, no, no. No? Okay. Anton? <clears throat> would the fact that the CBOC on September 12, 2022 suspended their operations for six and a half months would that qualify under Gagas as a subsequent event that should be disclosed in the audit? Oh, yeah. So the audit, the performance audit would be June 30, 2022. So that subsequent event disclosures would be a GASB requirement, which is something more applicable to the financial statement audit, to the event that has a financial statement impact. And there's, there's really no subsequent event disclosure method for the performance audit, but it certainly be something applicable to the 2023 audit. Okay, do you have another question? No. No, okay. Misha? No. Ariel? Um, I, I have one question. So how, how oh. for example, um, data, for example, vendors, and like what's your procedure to choose Thank you. 
Yeah. Yeah, I think I if I heard correctly, what is, what is the procedure to look at the at the vendor transaction at the sample sample data? Did I hear that right? Yes, that's correct. What oh, is the procedure? Yeah, okay. Bling. Yeah, good. That is a good that's a good question. So we we have the accounting records. We have every dollar that that rolls through the bond program. And we we then based on the materiality constraints, which is when you kind of say these are very large individual transactions, we're not gonna subject them to sampling. Sampling would be, hey, you pick a sample of the total, and if you miss something, then you have some risk that your sample was not representative of the population. So very large transactions, we would crop out and look at all of those. And then there'd be a random sample of the remaining in accordance with, there's a lot of thought that goes into sampling. This is kind of a, a total sample of what we're gonna look at. And then from each of those, just depending on what is the nature, is it a, if it's a vendor transaction with a, a construction contractor, we're gonna wanna see there's invoices, that support what's actually being charged to the accounting records. And we look at you know, the date of when work was performed. We look at the nature. It, obviously, if, um, if it's a construction contractor, we do wanna see that the work is truly construction. You know, we are not construction auditors. So we're not going out to, we're not, we're not going out to the site and taking you know, material samples, but we want to look at evidence of review and approval along the whole way. And so that invoice from the contractor should have a number of signatures, making sure that you know, work is performed to specification, making sure that it was in accordance with the terms of the contract. But a number of folks sign off on that before, you know, from the point of being received to cash being paid out. And we do want to see that all of those signatures were obtained along, along the route. If it's a payroll item, we're going to look at payroll records. We want to make sure that the correct amount of payroll is being charged to the bond program, as well as then you know, what is it that, that the folks are doing. And there needs to be some kind of documented evidence for all of it. None of it would be just on inquiry. So I don't know if that answers the question or not, but it's kind of a um, slice of it. I have a question. Uh, how do you define large transactions? So you said that you only yeah. So large, yeah, yeah. So we have um, you. And I I don't know how it was here specifically for for West Contra Costa, but but typically there's going to be a formula where the auditor needs to determine what's going to be considered what's called individually significant. Those would be the large transactions, and it's typically a percentage of expenditures in the case of a, a bond program. So therefore, something that is large and significant to a you know, $20 million bond program, um, or I should say something that is considered significant to a half million dollar bond program, that same exact transaction may be immaterial or insignificant to a 20 or $100 million program because it is typically based on a, it's a percentage of expenditures. So what I'm hearing is that you would like to know what that threshold was specific to this audit. And so that's something that I can work with Mr. Edelman on getting you a written response follow up okay. so that's that awesome. we, we yeah. can best address your answer specific to the audit. Thank you. And we can provide that in a follow up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have a question on, you mentioned in your cover letter about a significant risk um, and uh, yeah. you didn't say that the significant risk was management override of controls. You didn't say that you found any of management trying to override controls, but the potential was there. What did you see that yeah. made you? Okay, yeah. One, super happy that you read the letter. So a lot of folks should ignore that letter. So thank you. Um, it's a good it's a good observation. So, or it's a, it's a some, some context there. Nothing with the district changed this year versus the prior year. If you look at that same letter, and that letter is required at the conclusion of the audit to go to the governing board. In this case, it goes to the CBOC as, as well as the governing board. If you look at last year's letter, no mention. Look at this year's letter. It says there's a significant risk of management override. 
And the prior pres presenter touched on the two a similar question about, about revenue recognition, but that is due to a change in the audit standards that requires the auditor to tell the board, to tell the CBO in this case, what were those significant risks that were identified? The auditor has always identified significant risks and then used that to tailor the audit procedures. It was just never required to be reported to anybody else. And so the identification was for our own purpose because when we come in, we ask a lot of questions, understand the operations. And then the point of identifying for the auditor, the point of identifying a significant risk is because you're going to tailor your audit procedures. You want to address those significant risks. And so the auditor then should, you're expected under audit standards to focus more attention to come up with audit procedures that address that significant risk. And then you, you know, spend less time on things that, that don't matter. And so with the change in the audit standards, now that's being reported out to you folks. And the reason why that was done from the audit standards, there, there's, a, there's a board that determines audit standards, but the reason why it was done is because communicating significant risks, <clears throat> excuse me, communicating significant risks to those who have oversight responsibilities, help them just understand how the audit works a little bit better, helps them understand, well, what is it that, that the auditor is looking for? And maybe that provides a little clarity as, you know, to, to someone who's an, an oversight role. So in this case, we said, well, there's a significant risk associated with management override. And that, that risk does is present pretty much ever you, you go. And that is always true because in, you know, if you may have wonderful internal controls, but if someone in a high level position can just you know, bypass them, skip all of the signatures and just pay out cash to any contractor, well, that, that would be a problem. So we make sure that that possibility that someone in a high level position can override those controls, we need to make sure that that, that was addressed. So then to the end, there's no further mention of it. That's what you want, because if we then identify, we consider that specifically to be an issue. And if it turned out that it was an actual issue, we truly found evidence of management over it, that would be a clear internal control deficiency that would have absolutely have to be called out as, as part of the audit. So in a good world, auditor identifies the risks and then there's really no further mention of them. So you didn't see anything in, in our audit that would lead you to believe that it's just a general statement that you, that you put in so you, for your methodology's purpose. What other types of significant risks might there be? Yeah, the, the other types, so in a in a typical governmental audit, not not, not so much applicable to the bonds per se, but there's a number of uh, significant estimates where management has the ability to, in some cases, we're talking about really big things for pension, for districts, for governments to have OPEB programs or self-insurance programs. There are some massive numbers. I have one client with an OPEB program that has over a billion dollars of unfunded liabilities. And those are based on estimates, which means there's estimation uncertainty. Management can have an actuary come up with different numbers because of changing the discount rate or changing inflation assumptions or a whole bunch of things. And if management wanted to manipulate financial statements so that the numbers look better or worse to meet the budget requirements or for whatever reason, there is certainly the ability to do that. And those are probably more relevant and more, more tailored significant risks. For the performance audit, um, maybe not quite so relevant. But typically it's it's you know, things that could be a could be a big problem in the audit. Okay, thank you. Uh, John, do you have no questions? Okay. Uh, we do have public comment question. John? Thank you. Before I start with my comment, please. Just a reminder to all the CBOC members, if this meeting is being recorded, at please speak loudly and clearly and do not over talk people. Because when we get these transcribed, it comes back as inaudible or unintelligible. People think, what kind of secrets are they talking about behind our backs that they don't want us to know about? So please help me out on this. Thank you on that. Uh, my comments here, the, we on the West Contra Costa Board of Education 
has a wide amount of latitude in deciding how detailed they want their audits to be. They can delve into the details and provide real oversight, or they can gloss over the bond program and audit only as much as legally required. We used to have a pretty exhaustive performance audit. A few years back, staff advocated to the board that we really didn't need that comprehensive an audit, and we certainly didn't need the price tag associated with it. So the board voted to accept the staff recommendation and only asked for what I typically refer to as a bare bones audit. I also refer to it as the Walmart version, the cheapest version available no matter what the intrinsic value of the audit. It's important to understand that no matter what you're told by staff, by the board, or by the contracted auditors, the real purpose of the performance audit is to convince the taxpaying public that the $2.4 billion in the bond program is being spent wisely and in a manner that the voters will promise. They need to rebuild the trust of the community. If you think that everything has been hunky-dory in the 22-year history of the bond program, then why have we been investigated by the grand jury three times? Why are we being investigated right now by the grand jury? Why did we spend- Excuse me, John, do you have anything specific to this, exactly. to the audit? So exactly. when do the comments come up for the audit? Well, we're asking questions about mm -hmm. this specific- okay, you, you said public comment. Well, I'm allowing the, the public audit. to comment on this yes, specific audit. audit. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the quality of the audit that we're getting right today. I, Missing a lot of stuff. Yeah. I don't think- You want to shut me up? You just say, Don, sh shut up. And, uh, do you and, have another question? No, no, no questions. Comments on the quality of this audit. Okay, no, thank you very much. But I think we'll stop there. That is the kind of thing that the performance audit should be investigating. Any other, we'll go around a second time, Anton? I think the uh, public should have the entitled to finish their comments. I think it's germane. The scope of the audit is what Mr. Gosney is speaking to, is germane to this audit. This audit scope is significant. I would request that Mr. Gosney be permitted to finish his comment. I think it's on point. Okay. okay. Any other comments? Okay. I was just going to say that. Typically, and as is allowed under the Brown Act, I know everyone has had a lot of comments. Um, we put a time limit on comments, including, so we, we what we did is we limited two minute, two questions, Yeah. but we should have also said two minutes. Right. And the same with public comment. Yeah. Say whatever you would like to say that's, again, germane to the subject within that time frame. Okay. That's it. All right. Don, would you finish, please? Thank you. And by the way, my, I time these things out in advance to be less than two minutes. Very good. Every time. I said, I said, I said, if, why are we being investigated right now by the grand jury? Why do we spend nearly $2 million on a forensic accounting investigation? Why do we have so many negative articles and editorials written about our bond program, even on the national level? Never forget that it really isn't the bond program that is being audited. It's the people running the bond program. This would include our facilities people, the superintendent and the elected board members, the decision makers. One of the problems I have with our bare bones audit is that the only information they're auditing is the information provided by the very same people that are being audited. Do you see as a, this as a possible problem with limiting the scope of your audit this narrowly? The scope is so narrow that when I was, I was chair, I called the auditors to see if we could schedule a telephone meeting. I was informed that the terms of their contract said they were not even allowed to take that call I was making at the moment, and even as CBOC chair, I had to get permission from the associate superintendent to allow them to accept the call. Who might know more about the possible problems or concerns about the, that the community has with the bond program other than CBOC members? The audits used to include meetings with key stakeholders, but now the communication between the auditors and the stakeholders is zilch. So the audits come back less than complete. Is this what this oversight body really wants? If not, then reach out to the elected board members and let them know what you think. My opinion, this is an incomplete performance audit because it misses out on a lot of the problems that this bond program has. Thank you. Okay, if you have any other questions that um, were not answered tonight, please make sure Melissa gets them so that uh, uh, they can respond to us. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. All right, let's take a uh, five minute break and we'll go on to the next item, a pause. I, I'm 10. 10? Yeah. All right, 10 minute pause, please.
So come back at 7.32. Yeah. Thank you. And there's the restrooms are down this way if you need them.
You said 732? Yeah. It's 732 or, right now. I'm sorry. She, she's she's 720. Just, I right. think it was 722. 722. Okay. Before the break. Yeah. Yeah. And, or at uh, the beginning of the break. Do you have the. She has got here? Yep. Okay. Good. We back online. We are back online. Okay. All right. Our pause is ended. Um, we have one more thing that uh, to address tonight from the uh, agenda, and that's a. Um, WCC USD bylaws committee review of the BP 7214.4 BCOC uh, CBOC bylaws. Um, trustee, Madam Chair, yes, I'm sorry. we have a typo in the agenda. It is 7214.2. Two, two, you're right. Okay. You're right. Thank you. Well, I'm sorry. I think Tammy wants you as well. <laughs> Yes. And I'm very glad that Trustee Reckler brought that up because we we can treat that as a typo this time because in the agenda packet itself, we did bring forward the actual, the entire um, text with the revision of Mark. If we had not done that, we would not be able to hear this item because we notified the public yes. that we were doing the wrong thing. Okay, so. good point. Thank you. Okay, um, Trustee Reckler is one of two members on the new bylaws committee for the board. Um, and uh, you'll tell us, tell us what this document is and the different parts of it uh, for the review purposes, what's in blue, what's, you know, um, in the back you have several comments from uh, somebody by the name of Don and things like that. Just just tell us about the paper, okay? Be sure, I'm happy to do that. Thank you for having me. Before I begin with that, may I understand the time for this item and how you want to run it? Yeah. Well, we have, um, could we uh, work till eight o'clock and then we could bring you back next time to finish it up? Would that be, I'm sorry, Tammy? Great idea. Just wanted to add then instead of usually we'd have a motion to adopt all of the changes and then we'd go through and amend as needed that we would then take each, instead because we're going to have to do this over the course of two meetings. Let's do one at a time. We would approve one. Yeah, and we'll, we'll one approve as we go. Okay. So that's Point time. of order, you don't have quorum. We do. You do? do? One. Yeah. Uh, she came four, in. Five, she oh, okay. So now you do. Okay. Yeah. 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 Not too much. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So until eight o'clock. Um, yes. The next question I have is: Do you want to do it for every page? Do you want me to explain every page and then stop? Uh, you could just tell us the format of the document, and we'll go back to every page. How does that sound? Okay. Yeah, and do and you want to do any refresh for commit new committee members as to how we've reached this? Particular juncture. I think I sent them an email. Does any uh, does anyone have any questions on how we got here? Um, uh, yeah. You're good. Uh, Gia, you okay? Yes. John. Question relative to voting on this. It's my understanding that the board approved the policy on the 18th, and that what we're hearing from you or the board committee's proposed changes to the policy. And we don't approve your policy. That's correct. So I don't know what your motion is going to be. Yeah. You listed it as an action item, but I asked yeah. for it just to be a discussion yeah. item. So you as the group, I believe, Madam Parliamentarian, will take us from there. Yeah. I thought at the last meeting you had said everything should be an action item in case you wanted to comment on it. Yeah. And that is correct. Everything should always be an action item so that if we need to, we could take an action, even if it, the action is just referring something to a committee. In this case, they are bylaws. The revisions are here. So notice was given. If the board likes and approves the revisions that are being offered, the board can vote tonight to revive, to adopt that revision but not us we're not adopting we're, it yeah that's my point on this is this is a board policy now and these and 
the uh, the board members who you your committee went yeah, your subcommittee you went and looked at the policy and you had some changes that weren't enacted back on January 18th. And what you're informing us of, of these are the things that the board has come up with, but we don't approve your board policy. Yeah. And, and you we can say, our own yes. Yeah. Yes. You may say, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, you may say we agree with these changes. Yeah. We agree with some of these changes. We don't like this change. So I think that, right? I'm, I'm really saying your part. I'll be quiet now. Right. You're, getting our, you're getting our feedback, in other words, right. on your change. The ultimate, the ultimate decision maker is the board. Yeah, correct. So my intent tonight was to come for a discussion item to discuss this with you, but it was listed as action, and you may take whatever action you desire. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Good. Any other questions? Anton? <clears throat> Did I understand you to represent that uh, what we're hearing tonight is the recommendations from the bylaws and the no, committee no. set up by the board at the January 18th, uh, 2023 meeting? That, That's my understanding. Is that correct? Correct. So, and when did the when did the uh, bylaws committee meet? May and I will explain. I took all the notes. I put them together from what I heard from the community and what I heard from uh, my fellow board members. <clears throat> I met with staff, and then you are seeing what we have here. Mm -hmm. Now, the next the next steps, would that be to take it to a board meeting like we had first reading? We had this on the, uh, on the agenda for the board to have a first reading, and then they have a second reading? Correct. Okay. Board policy does state that there is a reading and then an action. Mm -hmm. at, a, at, a, at a second. And at that day. time, you can get public comment? At both can get public comment. Okay, good. Yes. Good. All right. Just understand what we're doing. Yes, <laughs> sure. Tammy? So remember, as we go through these, you can vote and tell Leslie, right. we, we like this or we hate this, mm -hmm. so that she can take this back to us, to the school board. Right. Okay, great. I have a question. It's not clear to me when the bylaws committee had a meeting where they solicit public comment. Did they? Because I was not aware of any meeting that they had. We and did I'm, not. It was an editing session. Okay, so it was a secret meeting. <laughs> I don't think you, if you want to call it a secret meeting, you can. You have every wondering that I have attached to the back of this document on page. 41 and on page 42 and on page 43 is everything yeah, of the well, edits. I, I've not had an opportunity to submit any comments because I wasn't aware. I was waiting for the uh, bylaws committee to have a meeting where I could do that. So uh, I think uh, that in that regard, it's not useful. But I do have a parliamentary uh, point of order. Go ahead. May I Met my point of order. Uh, the uh, our bylaws require that any recommendation to the uh, Board of Education requires two readings, so we cannot take action, any action at all, on this tonight. Well, I don't quite understand what you're saying. Well, yeah, why the do they need two readings for us? Because it's in the bylaws, madam. But they our bylaws. Uh, excuse me, please calm down. Please take, treat me with respect. Um, I don't, it, it's their bylaws <laughs> and they're going to have two public readings of it. We are just giving our opinion of what That's they right. are saying. That's right. That's right. So I don't think we have to have two public readings of our opinions of what they wrote. You're not taking action. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Tammy? You are not adopting their um, board policy 7214.2. I understand that. What I'm suggesting is, and our bylaws requires. <clears throat> Can you give me the section number on that, please, Anton? It's resolution 8, uh, 1809 that was adopted on August 29, 2018. I have the minutes here. 18. 
resolution. Minutes. It's our He's resolution, 18.09. He's not citing. <laughs> this resolution. He's citing a resolution of our meeting. Yeah, it, but it. it's our resolution, the CBOC resolution. And, and I keep not hearing the number. Can you oh, 18-09. Thank you. <clears throat> and it provides <clears throat> that uh, any recommendations to the Board of Education requires two readings. Therefore, I understand we're not adopting the board's bylaws. We are providing advice to the board, which my understanding is under our bylaws requires two readings. Two meetings. Would you like to read it? We need to see the bylaws, not yeah. the minutes. Yeah, we need to see the actual. Well, yeah. you'll send them a send them a copy of the bylaws. If you'll send that well, portion of copy. Well, if you'll problem, send that portion of the copy. The problem is the bylaws are not current on, on the website. So that's right. Another, that's what I've been looking at. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. So it's, it's very confusing. I have because a point nobody of, has the current bylaws. I have a point, a John? point here. Uh, presently, we're operating under the board policy that was approved in January to uh, <clears throat> 18th of this year. Part of the charge in the board, new board policy and it is a new board policy, it's completely different than the other one, is the CBOC has to establish bylaws. So my point is, the old bylaws really don't apply to the way we operate. Whoa. Unfortunately, we're operating at this point in time without a set of bylaws, because we haven't had time to put them together. Mm -hmm. The old bylaws are in effect until we adopt new ones. Yeah. We have to follow them right. until we get new ones. No, the old bylaws. So, are, I know from what I've read online, got a conflict as I within said, the, within yeah, the, the old uh, bylaws are are kind of ugly. So what the board can do is let's allow trustee director then to read through and make the recommendations. Since we do not have clear guidelines on this, that bylaw is not on your website, and the old ones we still have to work through. But again. These are not our bylaws. This is the recommendation. Let us let Trustee Reckler go through what she has brought. We already know we're going to have to do this at a second meeting. Second so meeting. Let, let us move forward. And we can do that. Okay. And that, at least that way we get, we really want to hear. Yeah. Having read them, I'm sure we all have, want, have questions and all of that. So let me get. Move I'm forward. not sure I understand the ruling of the chair on my parliamentary point of view. Uh, I think that I don't interpret it the way you do, <laughs> okay. but uh, since yes. I don't have it in front of me either, would you like to read it? No, oh. I would like to uh, suggest that you send it to it. We'll look at it next time. We'll when, uh, you, when you say send it to me, it's the official bylaws of CBOC, which the district has. So, you know, they can't it get it up on the website. It's not up to me to do that. I don't think. Well, but, but if you would, if it's helpful to you, I'll be happy to do it. Yes, John. My point, and I'm kind of real, uh, uh, reiterating what um, Board Member Reckler said is that all that we're hearing tonight is we're hearing the proposed changes. Right. And uh, Madam Reckler is going to take any input from us back to her subcommittee of the board. And then at, at which time we'll see adjustments mm -hmm. to this or it may, may be submitted for the first reading with the Board of Governors. But we won't take any action. We're just here providing okay. Input, mm -hmm. right? So we aren't going to vote on this. Well, we're our our, our discussion is lasting almost till eight o'clock. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, 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 I'm leaving we're, at eight. Everybody, so. yeah. <laughs> we, so we need to allow trustee. Did, right is that giving you enough time to do it, or would you rather do it next? Time? Depends on how many questions you ask, but I'm willing to get started. Well, well did, did I understand we're taking going to take votes on this? No, no, we're not going to gonna take votes. No, uh, so what happened the last time we did this, which was a couple months ago, the district it was brought to the CBOC, and then the district represented to the school board that the CBOC had reviewed it. The CBOC never took any action. So, is the district now going to say, "Oh, we had this discussion. There was no action. 
how do we know what the opinion is of the CBOC if there's not a vote? If one person says this, another person says that, what goes back to the board as the CBOC's position on item one? Oh, well, they talked about it, but, but then the last time this happened, the staff represented to the school board that the CBOC had reviewed it. And then the school board said, oh, that's wonderful. They agreed with it, they approved it. The fact was the CBOC never took a position. And I'm fearful the same thing is happening tonight. Right. Madam Chair, I think yes. you can assure um, Anton that there will be no vote on you tonight. Okay. Right. All right. We will so not then, could, could, could the minutes reflect that the <clears throat> that they we're going to have a discussion on these items and that the discussion has uh, should not represent the opinion of the CBOC on any matter under discussion of the CBOC in total. Yeah. Committee. Yeah. Is that is that's that a motion you're making? Is that a motion? Well, I can make it a motion if you need it, but I'm sorry. Yeah. We, I, I we just have... want the minutes to be clear that the fact we have a discussion, I don't want anybody to tell the school board that we approved any of this because a discussion is not approval if there's not a vote. That is correct. And the minutes simply request, simply stating discussion was held on this item, period. That is all that the minutes should state. Um, so there is no vote. There is no action. We did not even include in our minutes what that discussion was. So you can keep those comments individually if you want to, but those individual comments on during discussion, they do not go into the minutes. So it would just be discussion on this item was held, period. All right. You don't need a motion for that. Thank you. You're welcome. So we have 10 minutes left. That's you have 10 minutes because I have to leave at eight o'clock. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Is that enough for you tonight or would you rather wait and do the whole thing next time? We, I would make a suggestion that we start and see how far we get until eight o'clock. Fine, very good. Ready? Okay. Yeah. So on January 18th, I believe, 2023, the board passed revised board policy 7214.2. And where is that in our... our uh, oh, I'm sorry. You're absolutely right. We're on page 32 in your packet. I'm sorry about that. There was a first reading in October, which I missed. I was not there. The policy came back in January, but I had a number of concerns about it, passed it because I thought it was the right thing to do and got us closer to a goal. But I and my colleagues and the community had several improvements that they thought would strengthen it. The three areas were, I thought there really was some strengthening that the board could do on the policy. I thought that the policy dipped a little bit into your bylaws, which uh, concerned me a bit. And then it didn't align exactly with statute. And so those were the three areas that I wanted to get cleared up. Um, so on page 32, uh, first of all, throughout this document, throughout the code, they call the school board the governing board of the school board. And so there were different ways that the board was called. And so for everywhere that you see the governing board, that's corrected to align with statute. The next correction on the first page is that I thought it was very important to note that the bonds that fall under the CBOC are the ones that are passed in even numbered years with a 55% or more yes. So you can pass bonds in different years, but if they're not in the even numbered years with 55%, they don't count. So I thought that that was important to include. Excuse me, if we have questions as we go, should we ask the questions? Yeah, so I'm now done with all of my comments on page 32 yeah. and you may direct how you would like. Okay. Are there any questions on page 32 of the corrected 
uh, items she talked about. Uh, well, I have one that I'll get to you, Tom. All right, my question is even numbered years. Um, I know we had a bond in J in 705 or 2007. And I looked on the Caltex, um, California Taxpayer Association organization. They keep all the bonds that are on there. And in 2017, they had 55% bonds. But after that, it was on the even years. Was there a law passed or something? There was. And the year of that, I don't remember. But there, yes, okay. correct. And one of these gentlemen might know the year. Very good. No, I just wondered if there had been a Correct. law, I guess. Okay, that's all I have done. Well, my question is along the same line. I didn't know if there was a statute that had been passed dictating that bond measures can only go on a ballot in even numbered years. No, okay. they can go on in any year, but it is when they are placed on the ballot in even numbered years, passing with 55% or more, that they are subject to the increased oversight through a CBOC, and I can find that. I, I would I would love to see that. That's okay, totally ignorant on it, but it just seems strange that any bond measure that is passed on an odd number of year has no oversight at all. It that passes doesn't... with a 66 and two thirds percent majority, correct? Right. But it still is... with no oversight. That's yeah. I well, don't anybody... know the answer to that. Yeah. Yeah. I just I, 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 that just. Yeah, without absent seeing the the legislation, I I'm just gonna ask you a question. That just seems okay. awfully strange. Yeah. Thank you. Well, uh, but but Lorraine, you said Jay was passed in, a, in what year? 2007. Yeah. And the Caltex does were, have bonds, yeah. five percent yeah. bonds. And Jay is is a Prop 39. Any any 55 percent vote is a Prop 39 required yeah. the PBOC. So I I think the. Uh, the even numbered years is not correct. In the well, it may be now if that, because I looked at Cal, Cal taxpayers. Yes. But, but this, and in 2017, they did it. But ever since 2017, 18, 20. Well, if, you read the, if you read it carefully, you can do it, for example, a special election. You can do it when there's a primary election. There's some other options. Uh, but the point is that we have a Prop 39 bond that was not passed in even years. So I would suggest you just delete uh, this amendment and leave it the way it was. So yeah. what I will do is I have noted this and I will either find the statute or take it out. Good. 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 Is, is that sufficient, yeah. Mr. Younger? Yes. Oh, yes. absolutely. Page 2033. Moving to page 33, there is nothing. Is in, and then Madam Chair, I'll ask you if anybody has comments on that. I had a, a question. Um, I, I would like to see something about definitions. You start talking, you have the CBOC committee, and, and then you have the bond oversight committee, and then you have just the committee. Maybe, could we put in a definition? The committee stands for the CBOC committee, and also later on, you talk about the CBOC liaison. And at another time, you, you mentioned that the superintendent or the CBOC liaison, just a definition of what the, the CBOC liaison is, the superintendent's representative, something like that. Would that be possible? We're on page 33. Yeah, well, see, at the at, um, in the first paragraph, it talks about the bond oversight committee. Then number three says committee purpose. And you'll see in different spots throughout the document, it talks about committee. It, it's not consistent, like the governing board thing. It's not consistent. It's not either committee with a capital C, or it'll say Citizens Bond Oversight Committee. And I was just wondering if a definition might be appropriate. That's up to you. Yeah. On page one, in D. In the second paragraph, yeah, on the third line, it does have bond oversight committee, committee, or CBOC all linked together. Yeah. Indeed, right here. Paragraph that starts in page Ferguson. 32. Oh, in Ferguson. Okay. Third yes, line. I see that. Okay, good. Good. 
Is that amenable or would yeah, you like no, that, something yeah. else? Just so that there's a, and that would be what I would consider definite. Okay, I have one thought on that because it, it should say the quote is should be citizen final recycling, not just final recycling. Yeah. Then it's, and I would suggest you either decide as either committee or CBOC, just do one. So it's not an or, just to make it easy. <laughs> CBOC is very common. We use that a lot. So I would, I think that's more useful than just saying committee. Yeah. All right, we're okay. Almost eight o'clock. Do we right now? So. Shall we stop there and we'll start on page 34 next time? If there are, are there any objections? I think we could get through page 34. <laughs> yeah, Can we do pretty... that one? Okay. Uh, so All right. Also 35. Oh, maybe 35. Let's try 34 and All 35 right. and then All stop. Right. I, I have a question, uh, just a general question. As we go through this, will we be discussing what was deleted? Or will we only be discussing what was changed from the 2015 yeah. policy? Because there's some very significant items that were deleted, in my view, will not make us an independent CBOC. Well, I, I, my impression is that we're just talking about this document here. Okay, so we cannot talk about anything else? Well, the time is sort of passed. Well, I'm not talking about today. Or, or at the, the maybe at the next meeting. second reading of the bond thing. Second reading, we haven't had a first reading. <laughs> we haven't had a first reading. No, no, no. Of I'm the proposed about amendments, the, right? The, the BOE. Beg your pardon. The the board's first reading of the board policy. They already adopted the policy in January 18th. Now what they're proposing is amendments. There's not been a first reading of the amended. Okay. Right. That's what we're. What I understand, Trustee Reckler is asking for our thoughts, and then go into the first reading. Right. Well, then, but, uh, yeah. So I'm what I'm asking is this, as we, as the CBOC, review uh, the bylaws uh, committee recommendation. Will we also discuss what was deleted from the January 15th edition? Seems to me we would want to do that, so that we give the. Uh, if we ever come to uh, take any action on this, we would give them a full picture. It's, a, it's up to you. You're an independent committee. I'm presenting to you what we think is best, and you may do what you want. Well, what but, the board does, I don't know, but well, wait, am I done? We're done. I think oh, we're, we're done. done. <laughs> All right. Well, we're well, done. I mean, well, I'm not no the official, but the time is. Yeah, if there's no objection, we will adjourn. At 8 p.m. Very nice. Thank you, everyone. Else on the agenda? Bring that up next yeah. time. And no, I'm talking about all the.